Patrick Le Quemont, head of Renault Design in the 1990s and 2000s, was very kind to give me a short interview. What I've done is I've taken parts of that interview and used it to create a video about the Renault Twingo, which was the subject of our discussion. But in case you wanted to see the whole interview, I've also included it here on the Little Car channel. So here it is. So the Renault Twingo, so first of all, can you maybe talk a little bit about how the project came to be? Yes, indeed. Um, I joined the company, I joined Renault in October 1987, became the head of design as of uh, January uh, uh, 88, correct? Yes, correct. And um, before leaving, the, uh, the head of design, a, name, a fellow named Gaston Juchet, he uh, gave me these two keys. And he said, um, these are in fact uh, keys of garages where we have uh, uh, placed a couple of models of a rather interesting project, but which was not uh, approved. Uh, it was scanned uh, because we weren't able to make uh, any money. So I, I, as soon as um, Gaston Juchet uh, left on retirement, I, I had the two models uh, brought, uh, brought into the design center and uh, there was a not so interesting uh, model, which was uh, designed by um, Gandini, Marcello Gandini. It was a, a one box uh, vehicle. Um, and apart from the Gandini, there was this rather intriguing uh, little car, looked quite a bit smaller than the Twingo eventually turned out to be. And in fact, it looked a little more like those cars that are sold in France and you don't need to, um, to have a driving license. You know, it was just borderline, namely the car would certainly wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't give you enough confidence to go on the motorway. Um, so I, I looked at that little, uh, little car and I thought, wow, that really has potential, despite the fact that it had a, a rather, I'm not sure about ugly face, but lifeless uh, face. Um, but apart from that, I thought the car was rather interesting. Uh, and as I had been uh, hired by the president of, uh, of Brenner at the time, a man called Raymond Lévy, um, who had hired me in order to be a bit um, cat amongst the pigeons, namely to push the company towards uh, more um, innovation, you know, saying, well, Renault had been a very innovative uh, company for so many years, you know, coming up with, with cars like um, the R4, the first vehicle with a, a, a tailgate, and then, uh, then you move on to the R16, and you've got the R5, and, and the SPAS, which is called a joint project with Matra, uh, and, and others. And, and so I felt that we had the key there to you know, to open one of those doors, getting back into the uh, into the world of innovation, and so I, I made an appointment, and um, he, he eventually uh, agreed to come and have a look at the model, and he I, I really sold it to, to him. You know, very very uh, <laughs> a bit pushy, I guess, but uh, he agreed to put a small team of uh, engineers and uh, designers, of course to uh, try to find a solution of what could we do in order to make that car um, be uh, acceptable from, a, um, uh, from the, the, the economic standpoint. Uh, they uh, appointed uh, a very talented uh, fellow called Yves Dubray, Yves Dubray, that's it, who um, became the, the head of the, of the project. And the first reviews that uh, we had with the management committee, um, I had already gone through making quite a few changes on the vehicle, namely in terms of, of its size, its positioning. And then in a desperate move, as I was not getting any real satisfaction from the, uh, our designers in terms of changing the, 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 the face, I actually did a little drawing, which is something which I never do uh, you know, I, I didn't. I felt that was wrong to do that, but it was a bit desperate. And I drew this uh, this this thing, which looked like um, uh, like a frog, really, basically. You know, which I thought was kind of appropriate. And um, 
And so uh, we had uh, the, the car in the showroom covered up. The meeting took place in the, in the boardroom meeting. And really the results were quite, you know, quite poor. And uh, everybody was very, uh, felt that the, the likelihood of us being able to continue with this project was very, very low. And then came the time to go and have a look at the model in the, um, in the showroom. Most people had, you know, glum uh, faces. And then I uncovered the, the car and the car smiled at the president and then the, the president smiled back. And I said to him, this is, this is not a type of car that, um, that you will uh, leave out in the street, you know, at, in the winter when it's raining or snowing, you take it under your arm and you go and place it in front of the chimney. Now, most of the people in the room thought that I was going to, uh, com I was committing suicide. You know? And um, in fact, Raymond Levy absolutely understood what I was referring to, that it was like, like a pet, in fact. Um, and so the program was not uh, approved, but it was not rejected. It was, we didn't get it okay, but you can continue. A bit like, you know, you're, you're placed back into the, um, the death room and, and uh, until, until you, you know, another time. Um, and then the other time was uh, when we had, in fact, a, uh, uh, a market research. And this was the key point of the, of the project. Namely, uh, the results were presented at um, not at a board level, but it was presented with the, all the heads of the various uh, areas, be it product planning or, or marketing and uh, engineering and so on. And the results were as follows. Uh, basically, I, I would say that 25% just absolutely loved the car. They loved it and they were so enthusiastic. I had hardly ever seen such uh, very strong numbers. 25% said, I like it, but I wouldn't want to be the first person in the street uh, owning one. And then the 50% just hated the vehicle. That's interesting because, you know, it's all this thing about, you know, half a bottle full or half uh, empty. Um, I only saw the 25% as I, I, as I explained to them uh, just after they told me we've never had such bad results. Uh, you know, 50, we've never had 50% re, uh, you know, reject. I said, yes, but have you ever had a 25% um, uh, appro or, you know, approval? People who love the car. After all, you know, what, is, what do we aim for in terms of market share, uh, be it in France or, or, or the rest of Europe? And there was an enormous amount of pressure on me to wipe the smile off the, of the car. Uh, and... Um, I, I, I just couldn't accept that. I mean, the, the head of product planning was just silent. He didn't say anything. Um, the, the, the marketing people were clearly, you know, just were not uh, approving. And so I went on a weekend to the south of France, which is where I, I come from. And um, yeah, after a while, I, I thought, well, I, I, the only way out is actually to write a note to, to the president. Of course, before uh, emails and so on. So when I uh, got back uh, to the office on the next uh, Monday, I sent this little note, which said, you know, the, the biggest risk for our company is not to take any risk. I ask you to choose between instinctive design and extinctive uh, marketing. And so the, the note went to him and he came back to me and said, uh, 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 yes, I, I absolutely agree, my dear director, mon cher directeur. We'll go, we'll go ahead. And that's how the car actually uh, made it. As you can imagine, from then on, uh, when the car was launched and there was an enthusiastic response, and then later when the car did so well on the market and became a bit of a, a, bit of a legend, of course, as always, you know, history was uh, rewritten in the good old Soviet style, you know, with the photographs of people disappearing and new ones appearing. But apparently... I, re I, I read the, the story a uh, few years later, and of course, everybody thought it was a wonderful car. <laughs> you know, that's life. <laughs> but that's sure. okay. The most important is that the car was approved. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And it went on to sell 2.4 million in the, uh, the first version. 
Yeah, well, I was told, I, I read 2.6 because of where, where, well, okay, we were in that kind of uh, uh, figures, yes, indeed. But incredibly popular. And I, one thing I, I, I thought I'd mention is that um, uh, when Jeff Bezos was, uh, when the Fire Phone failed, they asked mm -hmm. him, so are you now going to stop taking risks? And he said, no. It's like, and it's the same thing. You die if you if you take risks. Yes. I mean, if you don't take risks, you become of course. Bored. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So, how much was this car a kind of statement of intent for a new Renault? Well, it was very much in line with the uh, objective that the president had given me uh, when I uh, had my uh, interview with him. In fact. In, um, in 1987, I, 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 uh, they organized a meeting at his home, you know, um, because they were you know, concerned about confidentiality. People might recognize uh, him and me. <laughs> and so um, I had an appointment uh, at his uh, house and I, I, you know, pushed on the bell exactly 100% at the time, which were, whatever it was, you know, 1400, like a, a military operation. And uh, came upstairs and um, he asked me to sit in this interior that looked a little bit like my mother, mother's house, you know. And um, he said uh, to me, um, you know, I know nothing about uh, design. And he said, oh, no, well, that's not true. I did buy a toilet brush where people said to me that it was very design. And uh, so there was a, a silence and a smile, and a smile in both directions. And I, I thought, I'm really going to get on with this guy, because this fellow, he had what might British people consider to be, you know, a, a, a typical uh, British humor, sense of humor. And so we got on just fine. And um, during all those, you know, two years, that I worked with him, not that many, unfortunately, because he, he then uh, retired. But I, I got on on fire, you know, really very, very well with him. And But the thing is that when I left his, his um, home, he had given me an assignment. He had uh, said, you know, given me carte blanche to, to do whatever I did, you know, accepted anything that I did, as long as it was good for the company. But basically, all of this was based upon the fact that Renault had been a, a very innovative company, it had been at the forefront of developing new concepts, really when you actually can pronounce the word concept and not just, you know, a styling gimmick. And um, he really wanted to get back to see Renault in, as an innovative company that people, when they think about Renault, they think of it as a, a innovative company. And so, yes, of course, the... Uh, the um, this first Twingo was a statement, and um, I had this sort of this phrase which said, um, uh, "An innovative design, whenever possible, a strong style in all cases." This was the the the, the introduction that I, I gave to our, our, our team of designers. Okay. Um, were you worried it would be out of step with the Renault family design, or was that the point of it? Yes, of course it was, you know, and thank God, you know, uh, uh, because uh, if you look back and I had the opportunity of seeing all the things that uh, Renault had done, which were, which didn't go into production, they were so damn creative, you know, quite remarkable in terms of, uh, of conceptual innovation, um, which to me was you know, very much in line with socio-democratic uh, uh, evolution. But their designs were often extremely neutral, and the, you know, the worst being the R9 and the R11. But the 21 wasn't uh, that great either. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, right from the start, um, I felt that we should you know, go into a, a different uh, direction. Was able to do this for, you know, for, for quite a few years until uh, possibly, probably, um, most likely, um, I was looked upon as being too powerful. And um, uh, when I joined the company, one of the things which I asked Raymond Levy 
uh, you know, I was joining this, this company coming from Volkswagen. They came and, and uh, fetched me, despite the fact that I had applied 11 times uh, beforehand. Uh, but they did come and, and, um, and hire me. And um, the, the, I, I, I accepted that I was going to have a much lower salary. But what I did not accept was to continue that design answer to engineering. I said it has to answer to the head of uh, R&D, and this is exactly what happened. And then, of course, later I was, uh, I became in fact the first uh, head of design answering directly to a president. And, and I was on the board and product planning was not, and so there was an awful lot of jealousy that, uh, that came up. Um, I was given an awful lot of good opportunities, namely, you know, I, I always said to Raymond Lévy that uh, the company was just slow, too far too slow in development, and that I had note, noted at Ford how much they had got, been inspired by, uh, you know, by, by Master, with whom they, you know, they worked with Master. And so when the time came, he gave me a, a project, which was to uh, reduce the development cycle uh, in the company. Uh, and I, I tackled that, and, we, and it was successful. You know, we reduced it by uh, one third. And so this eventually allowed me to be looked upon as being somebody who went just not just limited to styling, but really the, the design concept was, was uh, better understood. Uh, and, and this allowed me later to be, in fact, uh, asked to, to become uh, the head of quality, the quality department. Um, and so suddenly the position of, of, of a head of a design was very different to what it had been just one generation before. And I think that must have peeved quite a few people. Um, and so I, I had a, a time where I, I lost uh, a few battles for sure. But um, in any case, going back to the Twingo, the Twingo was a terrific way to start in this new era, you know, which, uh, which began as of uh, uh, 1988. So um, you talked a little bit about cost cutting there. How specifically did you build cost cutting into the Twingo's design and of course in, in the end of the production of it? Well, the, the, the car was, um, was weighed, was measured. Uh, everything was, was uh, really thought out in the minutest of detail, uh, via the, the, the amount of stamping operations and, and so on and so forth. But, what was important is that we got the fundamentals uh, right. Namely, the car that had been the earlier design had, you know, I felt it was too small and it was just, as I said, it expressed more of a small car where people would probably not want to drive on the motorway. So we, we made it a little bit bigger and it got to the point where I said, uh, we must uh, in increase the, the, the track, you know, uh, because, uh, as always with many Renaults, you know, the, the wheels were set in um, qu quite a bit in, and you sort of felt that, you know, you, you would approach the wheel opening, and you say, is anybody there? There, 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 The wheel was miles away. And then uh, they accepted, but then at the same time, they said, but you know what, you know, uh, this is uh, awful because uh, the, the, the track is going to be uh, wider than the, the, the next coming uh, Clio. And I said to the guy, well, uh, it's not because we got it wrong on the clear that we're going to do get it wrong on all cars. So it, it could be that I must have pushed people a little bit too too hard, which uh, meant that at one time, when when the time came, you know, I, I was I was given a very hard hard uh, moment. You know, I lived through some difficult periods, but that's life. You know, that's me yeah. anyway. I guess so. <laughs> um, so how did you get? So you're trying to revolutionize Renault. Um, how did you inspire both the interior, exterior design teams, all the people working on you? How did you get them in that mindset of revolution? Well, um, first of all, I, I, I um, hired quite a few people. Um, and I, I often uh, you know, had talks with the whole of the design center. Um, you know, I hate to use the word pep talks, but we, we, we did do a lot of discussion. We had a lot of discussions and uh, we, we all came up with uh, 
what was uh, was was termed the, the philosoph la, la philosophie du design or no, you know, the philosophy of Renault design. And so we we did, um, you know, it, it was not a surprise where we were going because we had discussed it and everybody within the design department uh, agreed that we should move. And uh, and so here we are, you know, but I'm not sure what else I can tell you, but I, first of all, I got on very well with the designers and the modelers and so on. And I, I certainly um, respected uh, respected them. I, I, I so much wanted to go to to come to that company, um, and and you, you know the, the the way that I the way the reason why I'm so in love and was in love with with Renault is that when I was a kid, um, my father he he had a Hudson Terror plane just after the war. It was the only car where you could sit everybody you know all the children and and wife single sorry, uh, and um, the the game at the time was. Uh, each was uh, allocated a brand, and you would count the number of cars that you crossed. Because in those days, it's not you know it wasn't like uh, um, uh, enormous motorways. And being the the youngest, they gave me Renault, and of course that meant that I almost always won. And so my love for Renault began just sitting in a Hudson Terraplane counting Renaults. So what were your plans for the Twingo after it launched? What was the idea for any design evolution? I know you went for kind of it's one model and that's all you got, but what were the proposals for taking it forward? Well, we, we, we made a choice with the, with the Twingo of um, adopting a, a very colorful approach. And in fact, the car uh, for the first few years didn't offer either uh, uh, white uh, or, or silver, and uh, you know we had these uh, different colors, uh, of which one was funny because uh, Raymond Levy, uh, of course, was Jewish, and uh, uh, he didn't quite like the uh, the purple uh, version because, of course, purple is is the color of grief, and uh, uh, so uh, he he expressed, you know, can you? change that color and so on. And I, I didn't want to change the color because I thought it was just perfectly, you know, perfect. And the whole of the color and trim were just really dedicated in that. And so we changed the name and I, I made a presentation to him and they were the, the cars. And I said, and this is our new Bleu Outremer, <laughs> which, which of course, the, we hadn't changed a thing. The color was exactly the same. We just changed the name. And there was a smile because, you know, he knew that I knew and so on. So, but, okay, so we, we had this very, very colorful range and we wanted to play on color. Hence the reason why we, we did some very special, special values. Not so much special value in, in the sense of, of reducing the, the, uh, the, 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 the cost of the actual, um, you know, we did things like a special series with Kenzo, which is my, my, uh, my favorite, where we actually did work with uh, with Kenzo, and they each each of these uh, cars were you know quite flamboyant. I felt, and they sold extremely well. And and uh, uh, you know the, one of the most uh, exciting things that I've done in my life was uh, going into to Paris just when the Twingo was launched in you know, driving a Twingo, and you would you would get to a traffic light. And then people, you know, would lower the window and say, what is that? And so on. It was amazing, you know. I mean, I've had, I've had that with a Ferrari, but yeah, so what? But with a car, you know, like, like that, that's, that's something. That's almost like a mini moment, uh, you know. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Sort of no, it was... Same visual reaction <laughs> to the minute. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it, was, it was a lot of... So, yeah, we, we knew that we were going to keep it a long time. And so um, we, we had a plan uh, to... Um, it, it, to to sell it with very very uh, um, not not su to, uh, to really to not to go for superficial associations, which is of, often the case when uh, a manufacturer wants to sell a car and they will do an association with a I don't know a, a, a drinks uh, manufacturer or, or whatever. We we all, all each time we chose really our partners. You know we we. And the design um, and design, the design department was involved in the, in the in the choice. So yeah, we we made it last a long, long time. Yeah, and and 
personally, I don't think it has aged too much, you know, today. It hasn't. It's, it's, it, it's a kind of as fresh as it, when it was in the 90s. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, sadly, or uh, well, maybe not sadly, <laughs> today, uh, this year, um, they announced that they're going to end Twingo production after mm -hmm. the... I'm sure you're, I know you're not exactly a fan of the second and third versions of the car. No, no, I'm not. So no. what are your thoughts of now they finally decided to end production? Do you think maybe it will come back again sometime, maybe in a 20 years time or something? Uh, well, yes, because uh, I, right, right now, you know, uh, Renault is uh, looking into uh, uh, producing a car which will be inspired by the R4. I fear it may be more of a more more of a just a, a few design cues which which are shared and and probably not the the the, the actual concept and the freshness and finding some new things. You know, my, my feeling is that the future is ahead and and not in the rearview mirror. So I have a great difficulty in in any kind of design approach where you you are designing. Uh, based upon uh, the styling, uh, superficial approach based on a car that existed uh, 50 years ago, whatever. So, so uh, I'm very sad that um, you know we're we're leaving that that segment, which is which corresponds very much to um, uh, a size of vehicle absolutely uh, perfect for modern times. Because I don't know about. What happens in the in, in in the United States at this point in time? But in, in Europe, the parking spaces are haven't been increased with the with with the cars, and so basically nowadays, you know, uh, it's extremely difficult with the type of vehicles, these sort of SUVs, to find a parking spot. You know, where you 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 for sure know that somewhere, sometime, somebody is going to open the door and scratch your you know your your body side. Or, or you're going to damage your doors. So, you know, the, the reason why the, 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 the Twingo, the current third generation Twingo is going to go, is going to stop is that, of course, the, this Twingo was developed with Smart and they, because they share the, 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 the platform, hence the reason of the rear engine. And um, uh, Mercedes has elected for the future to develop uh, a platform with Geely. And so... The, the number of vehicles associated with the, uh, with the with the Twingo is not enough to be able to uh, finance um, a, a, a new platform. So, every, like everybody else, all all the, sm the smaller cars are going to disappear. For some reason, I, I don't think it makes sense, and uh, I feel that um, that there are far too many large cars, and somehow. In terms of the intelligence that one would hope to uh, to be able to 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 display in the manufacture of motor cars in an environment where we are concerned about about um, the the, uh, uh, the the ecology about the sustainability to actually come up with these monster cars, you know, I, I just it, not for me, not for me. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Patrick, once again for doing that interview. As a small recompense, I went out and bought Patrick's book, Design Between the Lines, and it's a fascinating read. I highly recommend uh, you go and buy it. It's, uh, it talks about his time designing at Renault, his time as design lead, not just design lead, he did the quality, he was head of quality and all these sorts of things and um, all the cars that he worked on during that period of time. So again, it's a very interesting read. He's got another book coming out sometime later this year about his, t his time, earlier time, uh, working for both Ford and Volkswagen. And as I say, that'll be coming out later in the year. And when it does, I'll put a link in the description or up above or something so that that, that happens. Um, another book, which again, I'd highly recommend um, by Steve Saxty, is uh, also has some information about Patrick Le uh, experience working at Ford, um, particularly working on the uh, the Sierra and of course the the, the Mark III Ford Escort, Mark III Escort. Um, and again, this is a, another fascinating read. Steve's a really nice guy. He was the one that actually managed to introduce me to Patrick. So thank you very much, Steve. And, you know, it's a really good book. It's a fascinating book. This, uh, so um, again, if you want to go and buy that, there's a link in the description as well. So anyway, 
Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.